<coughs> the King Arrives is the title of the message. <coughs> <coughs> Here is a, <coughs> an account of Jesus written by an anonymous author. I wish I could give him credit. <coughs> and he said this. Here is a man <coughs> who was born of Jewish parents. The child of a peasant woman. <coughs> he never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never owned a home. He never had a family. He never went to college. He never set foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. And while still a young man, <clears throat> the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. His executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth, his coat. <clears throat> when he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. And 20 long centuries have come and gone, and he is the centerpiece of the human race and the leader of the column of progress. And I am well within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched and all the navies that were ever built have not affected the life of humanity upon earth as that one solitary life. Again, this was written by an anonymous author, so I can't give him credit for it. <clears throat> A philosopher once asked if Jesus and Plato should return to earth and were to lecture on the same campus at the same time, which would I go to hear? And he went on to say, who would choose to go and hear even so great a one as Plato talk about truth when he might listen to the one who is the truth. <clears throat> this one who is truth entered Jerusalem 2,000 years ago on what is traditionally called Palm Sunday, which is what we're celebrating today. And the passage that we're looking at that Bella read for us is found in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. And the details of this event highlight the fact that at his first coming, Jesus brings peace to our hearts. And at his second coming, he will bring peace to the nations. But before we delve into this passage, I want to provide a little bit of context to this first Palm Sunday. On Friday, before this event, Jesus left Jericho with his disciples. And on the way out, he healed a blind man named Bartimaeus. And then he traveled six to seven hours until he finally reached Bethany, which is the home of Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead, and in the home of his sisters, of his sisters Martha and Mary. And they spent the Sabbath in Bethany. And the Sabbath would be sundown Friday until sundown on Saturday. <coughs> I just lost my notes here for some reason. <laughs> so they spent the Sabbath at Bethany. And then after the Sabbath ended, sundown on Saturday, Jesus and his disciples ate at the home of Simon the leper, along with Lazarus and his sisters. And it was during the meal that Mary anointed Jesus with her hair. And you can read about that in John chapter 12, verses 1 following. And on Sunday morning, 
which on the Jewish calendar would be the 10th of Nisan, was Palm Sunday, four days before the Passover. And this is Jesus' last week. And he went from being the most popular person on the planet to the public enemy number one. And the events of his last week of ministry are as follows. <clears throat> now we're on the Sunday, the 10th of Nisan. Jesus entered into Jerusalem on a donkey. And then he went into the temple and observed what was going on. And then the next day, on the 11th of Nisan, which is a Monday, Jesus returned. Well, he went on the 10th, he went to the Jerusalem, and then he went back to Bethany, and then he returned to Jerusalem on the next day, the 11th of Nisan, and on the way, he cursed a fig tree because it was not bearing fruit. And that's when he also went into the temple and cleansed it from corruption. The next day on Tuesday, the 12th of Nisan, Jesus taught his disciples about his return, about the second coming. And it was also at this time that the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. And then on Wednesday, the 13th of Nisan, there were no events recorded in the Gospels. And so we assume it was a restful day for Jesus on that Wednesday and then on Thursday, the 14th of Nisan, the day of the Passover, Jesus prepared for the Passover. And in the upper room, he ate his last meal with his disciples. And that brings us to Friday, the 15th of Nisan, which we will celebrate on Good Friday. Jesus was tried. He was crucified for blasphemy. And then on the next day, the Sabbath, he laid in a, borrowed room, in a borrowed tomb. And on Sunday, well, we know the rest of the story. Jesus rose from the dead. That gives us some context to this day here, Palm Sunday. And I want to go back to the 10th of Nisan, the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem, because this was a significant date on the Jewish calendar. On this day, Passover lambs were chosen by families and were inspected for four days to ensure that they were without blemish so that they might be worthy to be sacrificed on the Passover. Actually, I want us to go to that passage in Exodus chapter 12. These are the instructions that the Lord gave to the Israelites through Moses about the Passover. And it says in chapter 12 of Exodus, verse 3, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, that is the tenth of Nisan, which is the first, first month of the biblical calendar, <clears throat> they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. And so there was lambs in, the, in a flock, and they would select one of those lambs. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons, and them according to what, what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. And your lamb shall be an unblemished male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. And the reason why they were to keep it for four days, they had to inspect it to ensure that it was without blemish. And then on the 14th day, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. And so while Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a, col on a colt, on a donkey, at the same time, all the Jewish families were bringing their chosen lambs into the city for inspection. And over the next four days, Jesus, as the Lamb of God, would be scrutinized, inspected by the Jewish leaders and the Roman rulers to see if there was any blemish in him, if he was guilty of any crime. I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 23. <clears throat> verses 4. This is the trial of Jesus. He's being 
inspected, scrutinized. And notice what is said of him by Pilate in in Luke 23, 4. Then Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. And then in verse 14 of the same chapter, you brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion, and behold, having examined him before you, I found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you have made against him. And then in verse 22, and he said to them the third time, why, what evil has this man done? I have found in him no guilt demanding death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. And so Jesus was scrutinized just as those lamb, Passover lambs were inspected. And if they were unblemished, they were worthy of being sacrificed. So here Jesus is found to be innocent. We also read about that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, where he says, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but you with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. And so as the spotless sacrifice lamb, Jesus fulfilled his role as priest. And he also fulfilled his role as a prophet. And that brings us to chapter 21, verses 1 to 5. Let me read those for you. When they had approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there, and a colt with her, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. And this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden." And so Jesus here in these verses told his disciples the exact events of what they would find as they entered the village. And when the owners saw the disciples letting the two donkeys loose, they wanted to know why they were taking the donkeys. And when the disciples said what Jesus told them to say, Well, everything worked out according to the word of God, proving that Jesus is a prophet. In the ancient world, donkeys and colts were valued assets. That was their means of transportation. And what the disciples did then amounted to today to taking someone's car. I want you to imagine this. Imagine trying to break into someone's car and the owner shouts at you, what are you doing to my car? And you shout back, my wife needs it. Well, what do you think the owner will say? Do you think he's going to say, okay, here, take the keys? No, of course not. He's probably going to phone the police and have you arrested. Well, here Jesus did what he did and said what he said because he was fulfilling the role of a prophet. He knew the details of the donkey and its colt. He knew how the owners would respond. Now, the first mention of a donkey in the scriptures is in Genesis 22. And in this passage, Abraham saddles his donkey and with Isaac heads up to Mount Moriah. And as we know the account, he went there to offer his one and only son as a sacrifice. And I want us to go there just for a moment and just look at these verses. Chapter 22, verses 1 to 3. It says, Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And God said, Take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering 
on one of the mountains of which I tell you. So Abraham, Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Now it's interesting, Mount Moriah, <clears throat> where Abraham was to go with Isaac, is where the temple stood. For example, if we go to Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, <clears throat> Solomon was the king who uh, oversaw the temple being built. Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David had prepared on a threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And so the reason why I share this is because the journey that Abraham and Isaac took on the way to Mount Moriah may have been similar to the journey that Jesus took on Palm Sunday as he rode on a donkey toward the temple in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and it's interesting in that passage in Genesis 22, Isaac is a type of Christ to be sacrificed. We have the donkey. We have the two servants. Maybe they're a type of the disciples who went and, and got the donkey for Jesus. Nevertheless, that journey that Abraham took with Isaac may have been similar to the journey that Jesus took on Palm Sunday. And in his role as the prophet, Jesus fulfilled what was foretold in the scriptures. Not only is Jesus a prophet, not only is Jesus a priest, he is also a king. He is a king. And it's interesting, as a king, you would think he would have luxury and prosperity, but he had to borrow a colt on which to ride. And this lays out a principle that we read in Scripture, although he was rich for our sake, he became poor. So as our sacrifice for sin, Jesus is a priest, he is a prophet, he is a king, and his kingship was on display when he entered Jerusalem and was hailed king of the Jews. In verses 6 to 9, the disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them, and he sat on their coats. And most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them in the road. And the crowds going ahead of him, and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! To the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now the question is, is why did Jesus enter Jerusalem on a donkey? Are not donkeys too lowly for the son of God? Well, it's interesting in scripture, a donkey is a symbol of peace. When, Roman, when a Roman ruler comes cruising into a city, it's not on a donkey. They come on horses. Roman rulers rode on stallions, followed by chariots and soldiers with swords and shields. Kings who conquer ride on white horses, not on lowly donkeys. For example, if we go to Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 16, this is a description of the return of the Lord Jesus. And it says in verse 11, When I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. Not a donkey here. Jesus is coming not on a donkey, but on a horse. And he who is sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which is, no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and, in his, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, 
so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with the rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So warlike kings ride on horses. Peaceful kings ride on donkeys. And that ancient king of Israel, the king of peace and prosperity, Solomon, when he was crowned as king, he rode into Jerusalem not on a horse, but on his father's donkey. The word Solomon in Hebrew, Shlomo, Shlomo, and Shalom are from the same stem word, and it means peace. And there was no war during the time of Solomon. He certainly was a king of peace. And notice how he comes into Jerusalem. First Kings chapter 1, verse 33. The king, King David, said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord and have my son Solomon ride on my own mule. There it is on the donkey. And bring him down to Gihon and let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there as king over Israel and blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. And so the donkey is a symbol of peace. Jesus comes as a prince of peace, comes to rule in our hearts, to establish the peace with God and the peace of God. And one day he will return a second time on a horse, not on a donkey, to rule the nations. And so Jesus entered Jerusalem to bring peace. He entered Jerusalem to fulfill prophecy. 400 years before this event, the prophet Zechariah foretold that the Messiah King would enter Jerusalem on a beast of burden. The verse 5 is a quotation from Zechariah 9.9. And I want us to go to Zechariah 9.9 just to see how it reads in, in, in the prophets. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Bring your, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, sadly, on the whole, the people of Jerusalem failed to grasp the meaning of the donkey. You see, the, the, the Israel was hoping for a, a king to overthrow the, the Roman rule, but Jesus did not come to free Israel from the tyranny of Roman rule. He came instead to bring peace and prosperity. He brings peace by freeing us from the rule of sin. He brings peace by reconciling us to God. And he brings prosperity by giving us his spirit. And one day, he will make a second triumphal entry at the very same place where he made his first entry, the Mount of Olives. And when he comes the second time, he comes to bring peace among the nations. Turn with me to Zechariah chapter 14. Chapter 9, 9, the verse we just read is Jesus' first coming, a prophecy regarding his first coming on a donkey. This is a prophecy regarding his second coming in chapter 14, verse 4. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, the very same place where he came the first time as he entered Jerusalem through the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east of the Mount on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. You know, many pictures that we see of Jerusalem, we, we see this picture where, where there's a dome of the rock, that, that golden dome sitting on Temple Mount. That picture is usually taken from the Mount of Olives where Jesus came the first time and where he will return the second time. And so he enters Jerusalem on a colt to bring peace. He entered Jerusalem on a colt to fulfill prophecy. And he entered Jerusalem on a colt to prove his purity. Why do I say that? Only Matthew here mentions two animals are needed. It says in verse 2, you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. 
So what is a colt? A colt is a young donkey that has never been ridden. So why does Matthew mention two animals? Well, <clears throat> what I think is happening here, at least this is what the commentaries are saying, is Jesus did not want to separate a mother donkey from its colt. Because this colt had never been used for transporting someone. And so it would make sense for Jesus to take both mother and her colt to keep that unbroken colt calm while it carried Jesus through the noisy crowds. If the mother hadn't been there, the colt might have just gone hysterical. So the colt had never been ridden until this time. And we know that, not from the Matthew account, but if we go to Luke chapter 19, verse 30, it tells us some interesting information about this colt. <clears throat> this is the same account. This is why it's beautiful to have the four Gospels because each Gospel that gives a little more detail of the account. Verse 30, go into the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one yet has ever sat. And that's how we know that this colt never transported someone. You see, only animals that had not been used for mundane purposes were fit to be used for sacred purposes. And so this animal, having never been ridden, ridden before, have never carried a person, was fit for the sacred task of carrying the Messiah. And so in this way, the colt is a symbol of purity. So Jesus riding on a colt proves that he comes to bring peace. Riding on a colt proves that he comes in fulfillment of prophecy. Riding on a colt proves that he comes in purity. <clears throat> so we spent a fair bit of time here looking at the symbol of the donkey. What about the garments? Well, the disciples did not have a saddle for Jesus to sit on, so they put their garments on the, on the colt to serve as a cushion for Jesus. And then the garments that they spread on the road, this was a, 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 an indication, this marked the arrival of a royal person. It was the practice among the Jewish people in Bible times to herald the approach of a king by spreading one's garments on the road. It's kind of like the term that we use, rolling out the red carpet. You roll out the red carpet for VIPs. Well, that's kind of what they were doing. In Second, uh, Second Kings chapter 9, verses 11 to 13, we see this going on. This is related to the king Jehu. In verse 11, Jehu came out <coughs> to the servants of his master, and one said to him, Is it all well? Why did this mad fellow come to you? This mad fellow was a prophet who said that Jehu was going to be king. And he said to them, You know very well the man and his talk. They said, It is a lie. Tell us now. And he said, Thus and thus he said to me, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. And then they hurried, and each man took his garment and placed it under him on the bare steps and blew the trumpet, saying, Jehu is king. And so this was a way of welcoming royalty. You put your, lay your garments on the ground, and then the king walks over it. <clears throat> and then the word Hosanna means save. Save us, we pray. This is a fitting title for the Messiah. In fact, when the Messiah comes a second time, he will be greeted with these very same words. <clears throat> these words, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is taken from a messianic psalm, Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. O Lord, do save. That's Hosanna. Hosanna, be we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you. Do send prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house 
of the Lord. And then if we go to Matthew chapter 23, verses 39, and this is what Jesus says. Sorry, 23, verse 39. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> what Jesus is saying is he's not going to return until the people of Israel are ready to receive their Messiah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So folks, pray that the Jewish people would recognize Jesus as their Messiah because that is when the Lord will return, when they're able to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And unfortunately, they're not able to say that at this point in time. And so Jesus entered Jerusalem as the prepared Lamb of God. He was inspected, he was scrutinized, and found to be faultless. <clears throat> the procession into Jerusalem shows that Jesus was recognized at that time as the King of the Jews. But this procession also produced perplexity, as we see in verses 10 and 11. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And so as Jesus arrived on the donkey, the whole city was stirred up. And this word here, stirred, is where we get our term seismic. The Greek word behind it is where we get our term seismic. And we know that there's this discipline called seismology, which studies the shakings of the earth, studies earthquakes and things like that. Jerusalem was shaking. The people of the city were perplexed disturbed, agitated, because they did not know what to make of this dramatic arrival of King Jesus sitting on a donkey amid shouts of praise. <clears throat> there was another time where, G where Jerusalem was stirred up in a similar way, and that's when Jesus was born. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. We'll look at this verse and close with some concluding thoughts. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem on Judea in the days of Herod the king. Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he? He was born king of the Jews. For we saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. The word is he was agitated. He was stirred up. And all Jerusalem with him. The whole city was agitated. The whole city was stirred up about this child born king of the Jews. And so in conclusion, Jesus arrived in Jerusalem as the Lamb of God <clears throat> on Palm Sunday, on the 10th of Nisan. And he entered the city to offer peace. Peace with God <clears throat> and the peace of God. And the response was either to receive him or to reject him. <clears throat> and many did receive him, and some rejected him. And in the same way, Jesus comes to us to offer peace with God and the peace of God. <clears throat> Jesus brings us to the valley of decision See, when it comes to Jesus, we cannot be fence-sitters. We can't be sitting on the fence in regard to how we will respond to him. <clears throat> so the question is, how will you decide? <clears throat> we can't sit on the fence. We have to make a decision. Either we receive him as our Lord and Savior, or we push him away because we don't want him to be the ruler of our life. We don't want him to be the Lord of our souls. So we either receive him as the Prince of Peace or we reject his offer 
to bring peace. How will you decide? <clears throat> my hope and prayer, if anyone in here is sitting on the fence, hasn't made their decision yet, my hope and prayer is that you decide to receive the Lord Jesus into your life. The way we do this is we admit our sin. We admit we are sinners in need of a Savior. We believe that Jesus died for our sin and rose again on the third day, and we call on him for salvation. And when we call on him, he comes to rule and reign in our hearts as the Prince of Peace. How will you decide? Many of us here, most of us here, have made that decision. We have received the Lord Jesus into our hearts. But sometimes we struggle with his rule. Sometimes we struggle with him ruling and reigning in our lives. But here's the thing. He must first rule in our hearts before he can rule over the nations. How can we submit to his future reign over the nations if we cannot submit to his present rule in our hearts. We all want Jesus to come back to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. But if he's not reigning in our hearts now, it'll be difficult for us to accept that reign in the future. And so my encouragement to you is to yield your spirit, your soul, to the Lordship of Christ Jesus. Why don't we pray? <clears throat> Father, we <clears throat> thank you so much that you come to bring peace. Peace with God. <clears throat> because, Lord, as your word tells us, we are hostile toward you. We are at war with you in our unregenerated state. And you came to reconcile us to you. You don't need to be reconciled to us. We're the ones who are, are hostile toward you. And I thank you, Lord, that you made a way for us to be made to have peace with you through faith in Christ Jesus. And I pray if there's anyone here in the sanctuary or listening online who has not made peace with you, I pray, Lord, that they would come to that place where they surrender their lives to you and call on you for salvation. For those of us who do know you in personal relationship, Lord, I pray that we would give you full lordship, full rule, full reign over our lives. Help us, Lord, not to grieve your spirit. Help us not to quench your Holy Spirit. Help us not to resist or oppose your Holy Spirit, but instead, Lord, that we may submit, surrender, yield and obey what your Spirit tells us, what your Spirit says, that we might walk in step with your Spirit even as your Spirit leads us. That is my prayer for my own life, for the life of everyone here who believes in you. So, Lord, we thank you so much for making a way for us to have that relationship with you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus and for your glory. Amen.